Lecture 26. Now I want you to、um, close your books now and、um, go over the map with me now and see if you can come up with it because you will be asked to draw a map. <coughs> okay, without looking at your, at your maps, I want you to go through this with me now. What's the name of that city? What's the name of that city? What's that little city right there? Good, Aaron, too. There's another little Aaron up here somewhere where Alma was going when the angel stopped him, but that's Aaron one, this is Aaron two. Now, Book of Mormon scholars, you see, got all confused in earlier days. A lot of the maps going around tried to make it out of make one Aaron. And、uh, just as we have several Portlands, you see, and other cities,、uh, it was obvious if you drew your whole map and let the Book of Mormon put the cities where they were, then you could obviously see that there were two errands, one on this side of Sidon and the one way over by Ammonina. Okay,、um, what's that city? What's that city? Ezra, and here's where the people accumulate preparatory to going to Antipara. Cumanai. They accumulate at, Acum- at Cumanai. Remember? The Ezra, Cumanai, and then, that's a heart. Antipara. Antipara. Say it again. Antipara. Antipara. And the city that uh, uh, is right straight up north from that is called Judea. Judea. An easy one to remember. But the next one up is not easy to remember unless you remember who's there. This is not Mulek, it's what? It's Melek. And the famous people that are there are the people of Ammon, the Lamanites. And that helps you remember the name of this city. It's Ammonihah. Ammonihah. People of Ammon are down at Melek. But Ammonihah is just three days north. Okay? And we think that Noah, no, we, it was in the vicinity, and we think it was a little more inconvenient to reach. So we have Noah up here. Now, those of you who were with me last semester will remember the cities down here. <clears throat> What's this city called? Nephi. Capital, first capital of Nephi, now capital of the Lamanite nations. Next to it was a city that the Nephites had also occupied during the period called City of Peace. Shalom, or Shiloh, some pronounce it. But it's the City of Peace right next to Nephi. Then there was one that the Lamanites occupied back in the days of Limhi and the Malachi and all the lost Nephites. What was that one called? Shamlon. And then this one was named after one of the early patriarchs of the Nephites. Who was that? Ishmael. This is where、uh, Limoni was converted by Ammon. Okay? All right. What's the name of that city? What's the name of that city? What's this one? Hang on now. <clears throat> You're going to make it all right. But what I do is,、uh, you get about,、uh, as I remember, 15 points just for drawing the map <coughs> on your exam. So, so that's worth、uh, having in mind. But、uh, what this will do for you, you'll notice how much fun this is when you're in a class that's studying the Book of Mormon. I listened to a real fine brother、um, trying to discuss the Book of Mormon here the other morning, and, and、um, he was going along and Then I became conscious of the fact he was making all kinds of errors, technical errors to be sure, and the people weren't、um, paying attention, so it didn't matter much. But, but he was trying to discuss the Book of Mormon. He was just confused. He didn't know where Gid was. One, if one of you had been there and, and said,、uh, Brother so and so, did you know that that was in between Mulek and Omner? And he'd have just practically fallen off the bench.、Uh, he'd have been so surprised that you knew that where Gid was in that relationship. But once you get that in your mind, it's so helpful in the Book of Mormon story. So, this effort that you 
exert will not be in vain. Now one day we'll have the actual geographical map of this territory, and you may find it's turned around a little bit, or there'll be some uh, rearrangement, uh, but it won't be much different. If anything, it will be just bigger. I agree with Brother Nibley. This Book of Mormon territory may turn out to be a lot bigger than our modern uh, Book of Mormon geographers have been willing to admit. Now, let's see if we can tell the story real fast. Amalekiah, apostate Nephite, of what uh, lineage? He was a Zoramite. Goes down, has the king of the Lamanites murdered. He woos his wife. Then he becomes king of the Lamanites. And while he's on his honeymoon with her, he orders the Lamanite troops under his Zoramite officers to attack. And they do go down to attack. And apparently... It was a lot easier to follow these valleys this way through these mountain passes than to cut across one ridge of mountains after another. So it was so easy to just march your army and all their supplies went up this way. They did this over and over again. So which city did they attack? When that army went down on orders of Amalekai while he was on his honeymoon, what city did they attack? Which one? Are you sure? Ammonihah is the answer. Why did they attack Ammonihah? Why not attack uh, something else along in there? Ten years before it was annihilated. There's no defenses here. That city is down. We'll go in there and smash them. And we can go right on across to Zarahemla. All this kind of thinking went into it. They found it was heavily defended, so where did they go? Noah. So we think that was a little more inconvenient. We put it up north, and that's the reason we put it there. They got up there, found it was even better defended, but they'd taken an oath to attack it. So they attacked through the entrance, lost a thousand men, including all of their leaders and captains, and they finally retreated and went back to Malachi. Excuse me, yeah, Malachi. And when he um, got the report, he cursed what? What did he curse? He cursed God. Then who did he curse? Cursed Moroni, and, and he swore he'd drink the blood of whom? Never got a chance, but he really would have if he could have. <clears throat> then he spent the next three years getting his troops ready for a real all-out assault on the whole Nephite civilization. He hates them with a vehemence and a vitriol that's completely diabolical in scope. Was Moroni expecting the attack? Yes, he was. So he labored like everything. And so he built these defense cities all around the perimeter where they were weak. And that city was what? That city? Then he went down to the southwest uh, to get these cities built. And Manti was well established, but what was this one called? The next one? Now these other two cities were old cities. Alma had even preached in them. But never heard of Judea before, so it may have been one of the defense cities. Now, Moroni said that, that he got all the people busy building these walls around the cities and everything. He was doing pretty good when two of the cities got in a big fight. Which two cities? Lehi and Morian. Who was the attacker? Who was wrong? So all the people of Lehi fled to Moroni. And of course, Morian decided that maybe Moroni may come and uh, really whip him for what he's done. So he decided to take his people and go where? land north. So he cuts right on up here, and uh, Moroni heard about it through his maid whom he'd beaten, and so uh, who did he have head him off? And Tiankum was the general in charge of what city? Bountiful. So when he stopped Mor Morianton and said, now, don't go up north. Moroni didn't want you to go up north. Stop. Did Morianton say, well, thanks. So, okay, I'll go back. What did he do? Fight. What happened to Morianton? Don't ever take on Tiang. <laughs> That's the lesson. We learn over and over again. Don't take on Tiang. So what happened to the people going in? They were taken back home and settled down. Peace established. Barely got it established. A whole contingent of the aristocracy went into a state of rebellion. What do they want to do? There's a new chief judge and so on. What do they want to establish? Yeah, they want to set up a king. So you got a whole new, every time the chief judge died or something, had these problems. So they set up a community all of their own up here somewhere. And uh, <coughs> they're determined to have a king. 
And Moroni is trying to think what to do about it when all of a sudden the word goes through the land, war. Where has Amalekai attacked? Where did he attack? Moroni, he hit Moroni. And uh, he, he said, mobilize, mobilize. This is um, M-Day. You wouldn't know about that, but all of us did. did. It's M-Day, mobilization day. And um, lo and behold, these people not only um, don't mobilize, what else won't they do? They won't fight. They won't fight Lamanites. Moroni was so exasperated that he went to the people and he got permission to do what to these people? Make them agree to defend their families and their loved ones and the liberties of their country or, or die. Um, these are the kind of people that had caused the death of thousands of Nephites, and they were now going to put all their lives in jeopardy again. So Moroni felt justified in putting their lives in jeopardy. Either you agree to go with us or... And he said that they were to, to agree to defend the title of liberty. The title of liberty said, in memory of our... Isn't that great? And during the exam, when you have to do that, and you make the sign, it's all right. <laughs> now, <clears throat> after they had been overcome, how many did he have to kill before they would have finally agree? And some of them still wouldn't agree. What did he do with them, the leaders especially? When they finally said, well, at least we won't fight you anymore, they were thrown into prison to await their trial. Others, of course, had been killed. Now, by this time, what has been lost? A long list of cities is given by Mormon, and he makes a little mistake in the list, one of the three technical mistakes in the whole Book of Mormon. <clears throat> but what, what group of cities had been lost during this critical period? The entire East Coast. Beginning with... Malachi was ready to take the one city that kept him from, from getting to the land northward and then occupying the whole territory. Who headed him off on orders of Moroni? Yeah. They got out that the anchor. <clears throat> was he able to hold the line? Yeah. Now Malachi had had to leave some of his troops here, 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 and here. So he was a little weaker undoubtedly when he hit this point. Tiankum not only stopped him, but forced him to make camp that first night over there on the seashore. And um, <coughs> was this New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve. Morian, uh, or uh, Malachi never forgot it, did he? He woke up on New Year's Day, and where was he? He was in hell. <laughs> so, <coughs> He yanked him and come in during the night while he was sound asleep. He never knew what happened. He just waited, wait, awoke, awakened in Hades. And the, the javelin had gone right through his heart and the solar plexus. He, it just paralyzed him. There wasn't even a groan or a grunt. Didn't awaken anybody. Tiankin was able to escape. The Lamanites with their Zonamite captains wake up the next morning. Lo and behold, there's Tiankin ready to fight. Their leaders lying in his tent with a javelin through his heart. And so the word went out what? What was the word? Retreat, retreat, retreat. Where? Back to that well-defended city of Mulek that Moroni had built. So they got there. So did Tiankum immediately uh, conquer the city? No, he decided to wait for what? Wait for Moroni. Unfortunately, um, Moroni realized the southwest was very vulnerable. So he was very... Um, vigorously trying to stabilize that area before he went up and joined Tiankum. Now when the Lamanites found they'd lost Amalekiah, they decided to appoint a new man. What was his name? What relation was he to Amalekiah? His brother. Now notice what he did. He took off, came down here, reported to the queen, and then what did he organize? A second army. And where did he take them? Right into the southwest. Now notice what he seems to have done. He kind of stayed in the offing here, in the wilderness, getting himself mobilized, watching Moroni, because Moroni's got a big army here somewhere in the southwest, 
And then he sees him march off. The beginning of the 27th year, Moroni is gone. And he thought he'd stabilize all of these cities on the border. He gets up here with Jenkin and doesn't know for four years that those cities were taken almost the moment he turned his back. They were gone. Now that's what Brother Nedley says, suggests that you have vast terrain that we're dealing with. <clears throat> much bigger than many had supposed. So Moroni gets up here, not realizing that this was all taken, and uh, he, he brings with him one of his very best friends who's also a general or a captain. What's his name? So they come up here and join the anchor. They move down toward Munich and they can't get the Lamanites to come out. They try all kinds of strategies, they just won't come out. So finally Moroni says, well, We'll bait them out. So he sent one of the generals right up to the city and down to the seashore. What was his name? Who did the luring? Who did, who's the bait? This fast runner. The anchor. Right? Okay? All right. No? And uh, so these soldiers look down and they'll say, Oh, look at that. We can take them easily. They're cut off from Bumble. They're way over here by themselves. Go, men, go. So they storm out of the city, the vast majority, the whole army. They're going to smash him and come back. But Tiank him, he's fast. Well, he's a good runner. And he goes right at the seashore and heads right over to Bumble. And he lets them stay right on their heels, you see. It was good bait. To stay just out of their clutches. All of a sudden, they disappear behind the facade. And who are the Lamanites facing? Lehi and a brand new army. Brr, they move out. <laughs> you know, they tear back here, and they just get back. They're racing back toward Mulek, and the, the city has been captured. By whom? By Moroni. He moved in there while they were all chasing up the beach, got the city, killed those who opposed him, then got out in front of the city, ready for uh, uh, the, the, the captain in charge of these <clears throat> people to come back. Now, Amaron has left, you remember. He's gone down here. He's working down here. And um, so we got another captain in charge of the Lamanites up here at Mule. You have to remember his name? Charge of the Lamanites. You're doing pretty good now. Tiankum, Lehi, <coughs> Moroni, they're all up there. Who's running the Lamanites? How about Jacob? Remember Jacob? Yeah, Jacob the Lamanite captain. <coughs> okay. When he sees when he sees the army of Moroni standing in his way, he gives an order to his men. What is it? There's only one way to escape. We're completely surrounded by Nephites. We've got to go in some direction. So which way does he say to go? Back to where? Cut your way through to where? Munich. Cut through. What happened to Jacob? Killed. What happened to Moroni? Badly wounded. Kind of interesting? So all those people were taken prisoners. And Moroni then took that whole army that hadn't been killed and took them to one of the cities. Where did he put them? As prisoners. Found them. And he had them bury all of the dead on both sides. And then he had them build a new kind of wall. Now the old kind of wall was a moot. And then they take the dirt and pile it up here. And then they had a breastwork of timbers, <clears throat> and on top they had the, the spikes. Now, Moroni does this differently. How does he change that? He puts the timbers here and piles the dirt against them. So if you were a, a Lamanite inside this city, what would you be looking at all the time? breastwork of timber walls that you made yourself. You set them up there. So they can't scale them. Now see if there was just dirt down there, why well, they would have been able to climb right up and get out from the other way. But this way, this is a real prison city. Any questions? Okay. Now, <clears throat> Amaron arrives back. This is kind of interesting when you put the whole story together because, though Moroni doesn't know it, here, Munich has just been captured, and a whole army uh, has become prisoners. <clears throat> he just lost this city right here, too. 
That's another story. So he goes up to Moroni, and he writes him a blistering letter. And um, he offers to trade prisoners, doesn't he? He wants those prisoners back. So he said, I'll, I'll trade you. I got a lot of your women and children and everything. I'll trade you some Nephites for some Lamanites. And he just really reads the riot act to Moroni, how terrible the Nephites have been. And he said, I'm a bold Lamanite of Zoram, and I'm going to avenge all the wrongs that the Nephites have perpetrated on the Lamanites. So Moroni wrote him back a letter. It was a sweet love letter, wasn't it? By this time, Moroni is blistering. He is really angry. So he says, I wouldn't trade you prisoners unless you'd give me what for every Lamanite? A whole family. You've been capturing women and children. I want a Nephite and his whole family for every Lamanite. And um, he says, anyway, you, you've been such a reprobate apostate. You know good and well what you're doing that it's wrong. And I'm going to defeat you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to chase you clear back to where if I have to. I'm going to take this war to where? Clear back down to your land. I'm going to take this war to the enemy. I'll take it clear down to Nephi, and I will so smash you and your people, you won't fight us for a few generations. I'm sick and tired of you warmongers coming up here, killing men, women, and children, and I'm fed up. Oh, that's a real good letter. I, I enjoy reading it. And um, did Amaron accept the proposition? He wrote back a real blistering letter, and he says, we're going to smash you, etc., but I will trade. And then he called Moroni a lot of names and got him even more upset. And Moroni wrote back then and blistered him. Those are two, they're two good letters. And then he says, and I'm not going to trade. And then he said to his captains, I don't have to trade. I know where, this, where all of our prisoners are, and I, I think I can get them. So meanwhile, Amaron races back down and tries to deal with Helaman, we find out later, because he just lost Anapara. So Amaron here, he's racing back trying to hold the the borders of the land, which is gradually being collapsed. The war is beginning to turn. Now, Amaron is gone. Moroni decides to ca recapture all their, or liberate all of their Nephite prisoners. Which city have they been hidden in? Which city? Not, not the Lamanite prisoners, the Nephite prisoners. Which city are they hidden in? It's the very next city the very next city that they want to liberate. They're all hidden in there. And undoubtedly Moroni had his spies out. They were doing intelligence work, and lo and behold, they found Nephites inside this city. It's Gid. Gid is full of Nephites. So Moroni says, I want a good Lamanite. Who's on our side? And somebody volunteered. Who was he? His name was Laman. Who did he used to be? He used to be a servant of the king that Amalekiah murdered. And then they tried to blame him and his associates for the murder. So he'd fled and come on over and join Moroni. Yeah, this is better than Hollywood, you see. We have reason to believe that the other servants had come with him. Anyway, Laman volunteered. Moroni said, now I want you to take some wine and go over to the city of Gid. And then he told him the strategy to use. And, and uh, Laman played his role beautifully. And we think that the, his associates with him were also what? Also Lamanites and probably some of those fellow servants because they, they are not challenged at all by the guards at Gid. So they come stumbling in close to the city gates. Now, the city of Gid was protected by an army. There was an army here out in the forest a little ways expecting an attack, you see. So Laman goes in behind this army and comes to the city gates, which we assume, let's say, right there. That's where the guards are. Inside the city, you've got a whole city full of Nephite prisoners. And so he comes staggering up in the dusk, and, and uh, the guards naturally say, who goes there? And he says, we have escaped. We have escaped. What you got there with you? Wine. Oh, that's real good. Come on over. Glad you escaped. Smart for you to bring some wine along with you. And um, Lehman says, I'm saving it for what? Yeah, I'm saving it for the time when we fight the Nephites. So we'll have lots of strength. We fight the Nephites, boy, when we drink this wine. And um, the guard said, um, said what? Oh, let's have some now. We'll get our rations, you know. we get our ration of wine just before we fight. 
So let's have it now. No, he says, I think we ought to, it's real good wine, really. <laughs> Here they are just drooling. And uh, so he reluctantly finally gives them wine. As a result, when they get it, they don't just sip it. They're just like gluttons with it. And within an hour of real good uh, uh, hard wine drinking, it takes about an hour, they're ready to go. They're lay them out. Uh, see, any policeman would know this. <clears throat> That's how you find out about these things. And uh, so within about an hour, they're dead drunk. Layman goes back. Moroni's moved his army up real close. And just as soon as he finds that they are asleep and drunk, they come in with what? They moved in around back of the city where the army of the Lamanites wouldn't uh, uh, detect them. And what did they bring? Food? Oh, weapons. Bales of bows, you see. And bales of arrows. What'd they do with them? Lowered them down over the wall into the Nephites. Then Moroni backed off. And he went around and he came in and confronted that army head on. So that when that army woke up in the morning, they're facing Moroni. So they get ready to back off into the city to defend themselves and the gates open up and out runs armed Nephites. A whole city full of armed Nephites. They're completely surrounded. So he got a whole bunch of new citizens, new prisoners. Where did they go? What did he do with them? They all went to battle with him. It's just bulging with Lamanites now. All behind the barricade. Now that's two city states. Now the Book of Mormon does not tell you what happened to Ammon. Apparently the Lamanites couldn't hold it or didn't try to hold it. It was given up because it says, and now he prepared to liberate which city? He now prepared to liberate Morian. So he's ready now to, to liberate Morian. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's Moroni's armies now, ready to liberate Morian. And he doesn't know that Zarahemla, the capital, has collapsed been completely taken over by king men. The uh, chief judges had to flee. Brother Nibley says, you're not dealing with small territory. Moroni was too good an organizer for that. This was just a terrific, uh, vast terrain, he thinks, to allow that, to have that happen. All right, Moroni is ready to attack Morian, and uh, a messenger comes in breathlessly, no doubt dirt on his head like the Bible keeps saying when they've traveled a long way. And he's got a message. Who's it from? It's from Helam in the southwest. And it has a four-year history in one letter. And once again, Dr. Nibley says, you see, we're talking about a vast terrain here. This isn't anything small or minor. So <clears throat> he starts to read the letter. And it's a sad story but a triumphant story. Because he says, just as soon as you left Moroni, we lost and the Lamanites were coming right in against this city, Judea. The captain or general in charge at Judea was named not Antipera, but Antipas. Antipas. Here was a great man. He would fight all day. He's exhausted. He's war weary. He's pouring out his life in service uh, in gushes. He knows he's not going to live to be long. He could be killed tomorrow. All day long he fights. All night long he builds with sword in hand. And, and he's practically dying on his feet. He's so weary. Because if Judea falls... The Lamanites get access to what? To Melech. And what's at Melech? All of the Lamanites who are converted to the church that the Lamanites hate with such vigor. So here's poor Antipas trying to hold it. The people of Ammon say, Brethren, think of the thousands of Nephites that have died trying to defend us. First when we were up in the land of Jershon, now down here at Melech. Just look what's happening. Whole cities have been lost. Now they're about to take Judea, and Nephites are dying by the thousands defending us. Let's fight. Now, were they willing to fight? Were they going to fight? 
Who stopped him? President of the church. President of the church. What was his name? Helaman. And he said, no, don't violate your oath. We have to keep reminding ourselves <clears throat> how wicked these people had been and how depraved they'd been as they raided and looted and scalped and tortured and raped and then found out what, how terrible that had been. They'd been taught that that was a virtue. And then they, were, they joined the God church and found out that it was so abhorrent and terrible they just couldn't hardly look at themselves in the mirror. And so they'd made this covenant with God. They would not shed blood even if their own lives were taken. Now Nephi, or Helaman says, now you owe it to yourselves not to violate that covenant, and I have a suggestion for you. You have your young teenagers, 14, 15, 16. They didn't make that covenant. So that's about all the years it's been. And um, there would have been some of them that were coming along in years when they left um, that land after making their covenant, but most of them are only going to be 14 to 17 years of age. Just Eagle Scouts, that's all. And uh, he says, they have, they're not under the covenant. They didn't have all those crimes to get uh, blotted out, so let them fight. So they talked to their young people, their teenagers, and how many came up? How many were willing to go fight? And then they, uh, after the custom of the Nephites, they elected their general. They're allowed to have their own captain or leader. And so they elected whom? Yeah, they want the president of the church. It'd be nice to have the president of the church as their general. Helaman, you, you what? Who? <laughs> yeah, we'd like to have you if you don't mind. All right, he said, all right, I'll go. So he leads his 2,000 Boy Scouts out of um, um, the, the city of Melech and headed toward Gideon, I mean Judea. And here you've got um, um, Antipas, fighting all day, struggling all night to rebuild their defenses, and he looks down the road, and here comes this troop of 2,000 youngsters. But they got bows and arrows, beautiful rippling teenage muscles. Who else saw them? Yeah, you see, the Lamanites were fighting by day. They, weren't, they were around there, too. And they took a good look. Here, is, here's, here are 2,000 youthful teenage troops which represents a 30% increase in the strength of Antipas. And so they all went back to Antipera, the city, to report that he had been strengthened and stopped fighting. This gave Antipas a chance to build the defenses of the city. And then there came 2,000 men from where? This time from where? Zarahemla. And they bring food with them. So Antipas is now becoming quite strong. In fact, strong enough so that when he'd rebuilt the defenses, he said to Helaman, let's go up and take Antipera. Now, to take Antipera, they got to lure the army out. Would the army come out? They wouldn't come out. So they decided to use the old trick. And the reason this trick works, works is because it was a policy of the Lamanites and the Nephites. Whenever they caught a group of the enemy troops uh, you know, doing a little reconnaissance uh, around through the woods, cut them off and, and take care of them. So that's why both armies could, could easily fall for these lures under certain circumstances. So notice what he did. His troops come out of Judea, that is, uh, Helaman's 2,000 scouts come out of Judea and they come marching right past Antipara as though they were going where? down to the beach where there was a city that apparently was still in the hands of the Nephites and needed supply. So he marches right past. Now if you were general there in Antipara, you saw these kids go by, and you'd say, for heaven's sake, this is just too much. We've got to wipe them out. We've got to take care of them. So he was foolish enough to bring out practically his own army so there'd be a smash attack and retreat back to end of Paris. And so he started chasing him. Helaman's fast, so are his boys. They're all in good training, been jogging regularly now, in good shape here. And Helaman leads these troops around and then starts up north. And at the end of the first day, they camp. And the next morning, his scouts tell him that they're on the way again. They're after us. All right? Helaman says, let's go. So they traveled all that day, and he went up into the wilderness. They're right on his tracks. 
and then they sleep that night and the next morning they get up bright and early ready to run again what happened what happened third this is the third day morning of the third day no action no Lamanites nobody in sight Helaman says to his boys this means that either Antipas caught up with them and they're fighting or else these they've they've headed back <coughs> if it's a fight they'll kill Antipas and his men because they're just not strong enough so let's go back it may mean a fight boys you ready to fight not one of them had ever fought before were they willing to fight yeah they said mom mom said it would be all right we're let's go we're ready <coughs> and so back they went was there a fight going on there really was blood all over the place who was winning the Lamanites what had happened to Antipas dead and uh, what was happening to the rest of the troops what were they just about to do run in fact they were in the process of running so Helaman led in this is hand to hand combat and you, you come right into the rear go, uh, echelons of the enemy and of course all of a sudden the Lamanites realize that something's going on at the rear guard they turn around and storm back to knock out Helaman what happened to the troops of Antipas? Did they respond then and come back? Yes, they did. Who won? Nephites won. What happened to all these Lamanites? They were taken prisoners and sent where? Zarahemla. Helaman then comes back <coughs> to Judea and gets a message from Amaron. See, Amaron's just been up here and he's lost Mulek. <coughs> and now he comes comes down here and he communicates with Helaman and wants to trade what for prisoners? For all of that army that he lost, what will he trade? Not quite. Not quite. What will he trade this time? The city of Antipara. I'll give you Antipara if you'll give me back all those men. Well, where are those men headed right at this moment? Sure, they're on the way to Sarah Helaman. Helaman hasn't even got them. So he writes back and, uh, and says he'll trade, won't he? Now, what, what did he say? What, what, what was his answer? I will not trade prisoners because we can do what? We can take Antipara anyway. Then did he get some recruits? Did he get some support? Yeah, about 6,000 came in. He's ready to take Antipara. The Lamanites take one look at Helaman's 2,000 plus uh, all his support, and they take off. And he gets Antipara without even a fight. Now, after he had occupied Antipara, he moved in on Cumani. Now, Cumani was not, um, you just couldn't take it. You just couldn't defeat Cumani. Would the soldiers come out and fight? No. So what did they decide to do in order to make Cumani give up? Besieged it, cut off all their supplies. And did they finally give up? Yeah, they finally gave up. Then what was Helaman's problem? What was his problem then? He had more prisoners than he had troops. And as a result, uh, they kept, even after they'd given up, what did they keep doing? They keep breaking loose and uh, so forth. So he had to kill a couple of thousand of them just to uh, keep the peace. And uh, this was not good. And so he said to one of his generals, why don't you take these people? I'll give you a good contingent of troops and and you just march them back to Zarahemla. Let's get them out of here. So did he start? Yes, sir, he started. And he'd gotten out one day. And all of a sudden, a fellow comes storming into camp and screaming at the top of his voice, apparently. Stupid man. The Lamanites are attacking Cumani. See, they had sent up a support army of reinforcements, and they'd arrived just after the Lamanites had given up. And so what happened to the Lamanite prisoners when they heard this, this news? They rebelled and started to break loose. And so what did the Nephite general have to do? He had to kill nearly all of them, but some did escape. But the vast majority of those Lamanites were all killed trying to escape. Then what did the Nephite general do? Headed back for Cumani. No, Antipara was given up, you remember. Antipara was just surrendered. You remember, they just abandoned Antipara. 
You recall that? Okay. Now this was all around Cumani. It was Cumani that was besieged. And um, so th when the, they got back, poor Helaman and his 2,000, in fact, he'd received 60 additional boys by now. You got 2,060. Were they about to go down? Yes, sir. This was a terrible fight. Fresh Lamanite troops. And this, this other Nephite general arrived just in the nick of time, and it was, they were able to swing the, in, in their defense. Finally, they drove the Lamanites away, and they all fled over toward Manti, and they were able to take the city. As soon as the fighting had stopped, Helaman went out among the dead to find out how many of his boys had been killed. How many were dead? How many were unconscious from lack of, from, from a bleeding? Uh, how many had been wounded? Every single 2060 was just cut, cut, cut. And, uh, and how many had fainted from loss of blood? A couple of hundred fainted from loss of blood. But to his amazement, they're not dead. So they're bandaging up these teenage boys. And, and uh, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but you get a, a, a blade cutting right across a muscle in your upper arm. You get a blade cutting across here. You get a blade cutting across a thigh. The fact that these boys continue fighting, you see, they'll have a few months of uh, recuperation. They're awfully stiff and sore, and they got that real bad one right through the shoulder. That shoulder really hurts. A little bursitis there, they'd call it probably. And, uh, but these boys keep going. Now, men who've been around military, and you've seen some of your boys wounded, and then come on back in and fight, See, ordinarily in our troops, if, if they're badly wounded, we send them home. They've, they've earned a rest and are discharged. These boys, they get healed up, and, and boy, they're back there with sliced arms and, and so forth, big old scars and wounds across their faces and their foreheads and on their arms, etc. They're, they're just great fellows. And so um, now Helaman was ready to attack what city next? What city was the next one attacked? Manti, what happened to Zeezrom? It apparently was just surrendered like, which one was surrendered to Moroni? Omner. So you've got two of the cities that are apparently just given up. Okay? All right. Now we'll um, finish up on Thursday, and then we'll have our test on Tuesday.